So this is this is the visual editor talk. Um, anyways, uh, we, we'd like to talk to you about a uh, a project that we've been working on at the Wikimedia Foundation to uh, to make it easier to edit Wikipedia. All right. So we've got pretty much. Well, we've got the Wikimedia Foundation funded part of the visual editor team all here. Um, I'm Ron Catal, this is Trevor Pascal, and here from right to left for you guys is Rotmo and Timo Taihoff, who's not on the slides yet because we're adding him to the team as of Monday, and James Forster. Um, we also have two guys from Wikia on our team, Enos Kaczynski and Christian Williams, and they, they're back in San Francisco, they couldn't make it out here. Um, so the seven of us work on the visual editor proper, and there's two people that work on a project called Parsoid, a new parser for Wikitext that is instrumental in making the editor. These are Gabriel and Subu, and they could also not make it out here, unfortunately. So you, you recognize this. You guys are Wikipedians. You recognize this. It's a Wikipedia article. And this is actually it's an article about a show that uh, Trevor likes to talk about a lot, so Trevor, you should edit this article. Just okay. hit edit, right? Let me see what I can do. Uh, maybe not. What is all this? Well, it's wiki text. And um, yeah, you know, the thing is, is that there's a lot of really smart people that have a lot to contribute that still find this to be confusing. This is not a good IQ test. But also, this has nothing to do with what I just looked at. It's completely disconnected. You know, this is an info box. It's, it's completely uh, disconnected from the view is the biggest problem. And OK, this room's full of geeks and weirdos and Wikipedia editors. And that's awesome. But you know, the world has a lot of other people in it. And there's people are online now. The world is, uh, you know, I guess more normal than us. So we, they like simple things. And simple things are growing really fast. And we're not really growing as fast because we're not simple. And this is starting to affect our bottom line. So it's not just about growth. If we don't make this easier, it's just about, it's just about staying alive. So this is a really important project to us. And, um, and, and I think you know, everyone in here can appreciate that. So I've been pretty obsessed about this problem for the past few years. Um, I started the Wikimedia Foundation in 2008, and I was on the usability initiative. And uh, we started looking at these problems um, pretty seriously. And a lot of what we're working on is just the step after the step after the step from, from that, initial, that initial project. Um, but you know, the thing is, is that editing should be more like using a word processor. Um, but people who have tried to uh, shoehorn it into that in the past have failed pretty bad um, because it's, it's a lot more complex than uh, a typical web page. Um, I mean, it needs, to, it needs to be visual, yes. But it, it, needs to be, um, it needs to be clear, like what's text and what's an object. Um, it, it, it needs to be like, easy to make things and, and difficult to break things. But also, editing should be fun, right? Here, here. Here, here, I hear in the room. And this oh. looks like fun. Like, this is really simple. But that might be a little too fun, because now we have some vandalism. And, and this leads us to our first problem. Um, if you make this easier for people to edit, then a flood of edits come in. And this is the user interface that we have to deal with to try and combat this flood of edits of people just messing around. We've made it so easy. And um, we need to keep this ecosystem balanced. I mean, right now, as much as we don't like that editing is difficult, it's at least about as difficult as reviewing. So things seem to be about in balance. If, uh, if we make it easier to edit, then it'll be relatively you know, more difficult to review. And the wiki will get corrupted. But if we, uh, dude, if you make it, um, easier to, to review than to edit, or if you make it harder to edit, then the wiki will die of oppression. You'll just get like politics and people fighting newbies and crap. And that, 
that actually, to a certain degree, is actually happening. We have other teams at the foundation working on that. And we have other, other teams at the foundation uh, working on the review problem and trying to make it easier to review as we make it easier to edit. But that's, that's a separate presentation, which might or, not, might or may not also be in this track. Eric says no. No. But the thing, the thing is, we realize that we're only working on one piece of this, because we have to keep things in balance, and we can't just, just make it easier. But we, but we do need to make it easier. Um, who, who in here could consider themselves to be a Wikitext enthusiast? You're really good at Wikitext. It's a power tool, right? Well, the thing is about the visual editor, it would be a lot easier if we could just not have Wikitext anymore. And we could just convert everything to HTML and let you guys edit that with a visual, yeah, that's not gonna work. Because we, taking Wikitext away from editors is like taking guns away from Americans. <laughs> we might have to pry it out of your cold, dead hands. And the truth is, it's going to be a while until we have an editor that's full featured enough to even justify that. There would be so much functionality that you guys currently have that you wouldn't in a visual editor if we rolled it out today. But theoretically, over time, you could continue to add features. And as the, uh, as the, as the things that you can do in the visual editor reaches everything, the preference for using Wikitext might reach nothing. But the problem with that is it's a long tail. And like, to what extent are we really going to do that? Like, if you brought the Max in Portland to within four blocks of everybody, that would be awesome. But it's also very impractical, and that's why some people have to take the bus. I mean, so, some features are just not going to be as high priority. And even if we get to them eventually, it's going to be a really long tail. So in the meantime, we know that we're going to have to be able to coexist with Wikitext because it's possibly never going to die. So what the what visual editing will do though is make more people edit and will it will also make more people edit faster because they don't have to waste all this time figuring out all this Wikitext. So of course what's hap what happens if more people drive and they all drive faster, you get LA traffic and you get a lot of collisions, right? So obviously, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna make editing easier and quicker, we're gonna have to come up with a better way to deal with conflicts. And um, what we currently do is um, we sort of let one person win, and then we try to reconcile the other person's change with it. And we do this by viewing the change, by viewing the two changes as big chunks of, of change. So if one person makes a big change, the other person makes a big change, then it goes and see if they're mergeable, and you probably changed the same word or something somewhere. You have a slight bit of overlap, and it goes, I give up. Too complicated. You guys over overlapped. You figure it out. So that's not really useful, and that's because we don't, we don't have a way to intelligently split things up. So instead, what would be nicer, and this is something that will um, that, that is a direction that we'll actually be able to go in with Visual Editor is if you can do, if you can um, split up each change into multiple chunks, which in the editor you can do because you, the editor knows how the person made the change. They know what logical changes they made in what order. Um, then you might be able to reconcile some or not all of them. And you might be able to um, uh, fix a lot of the conflict for them and, and make that nicer. What we're also looking into, or going to look, in, look into in the long term, is real-time collaboration where you wouldn't even have added conflicts in the way that it is now, because they would occur in real time. Everyone would be editing the same article at the same time, and if there's a conflict, it will just be fixed as it occurs. But that is a long way out, and we're not actively working on it. There is a Google Summer of Code student that is working on some of the real-time editing infrastructure, but we're not, uh, the foundation is not currently working on it, but we are designing the system such that real-time editing should be, well, not easy, but should possible. be possible to build <laughs> on top of the system. It's, yeah. it's never easy, it's, it's hard. And, and, and these, uh, these granular bits of like what we call transactions, the, the way that you got to your, your uh, final state, we can also use them to make, uh, instead of, looking at the history of a, a series of diffs, you could actually play it back and watch what people did to get there. There's some, uh, there's some details in 
how we're going to do collaboration, how we're going to do playback to respect people's privacy, to make sure that attribution works properly. So this isn't all clear cut and dry, but these are the things on the horizon that we're designing around. So the thing is, is like the visual editor is just one piece. There's a lot of other pieces. Thankfully, we're working on a lot of them. But, um, but I, I just want to like stress that like, we as a team are like really aware that, um, that this is part of a whole ecosystem. And uh, we're really looking forward to like this technology enabling a lot of other improvements all around MediaWiki. Right, so let's talk about Wikitext. Um, Wikitext is basically just a markup language that uses special characters to describe things, right? So there's structure, and there's text content, and there's formatting. And we have it because this is easier than this, which is HTML. Um, HTML is, a lot of people write HTML by hand, um, but it's not really optimized for writing by hand. And as we found, it's also not really optimal for, um, uh, for use in an editor either. So the data model that we use internally in the editor looks more like this. This is a JSON representation of what the visual editor thinks about when you are editing a document. Um, it's even more verbose. Than, um, than HTML, and as you might have noticed, every character is its own array element, and every annotated character, such as the bold B, has a separate annotation, so this gets very unwieldy very quickly. So when we're drawing stuff on a whiteboard, we kind of draw it like this. And the important thing is that um, it's, um, it's easy, without affecting other parts of the model, to um, delete data and insert data. As long as you know that what you're doing is, is sane and won't like break uh, the consistency of the model, uh, you can do everything within, you know, like it will all have localized effects. So what is especially nice is if you're selecting arbitrary and text, texts, which you can del then delete. And it will, because it's, an, it's more like an HTML token stream, it will merge the two things. This is not really, this projector is not really very sharp. It's small text, it's okay. It's small text, yeah. So it's actually, I've actually deleted it across a paragraph boundary and it's now merged the paragraphs. And you can do this because you have an HTML token stream as opposed to actual HTML nodes where that would be a lot more uh, complicated. It means that we can also define transactions on this, so let's, let's go back. What I just did can be described as three operations I retained 13 things. I replaced a bunch of stuff, my selection, with nothing. And then I retained six more things. So we have a transaction processor that applies these operations to this document. And you can flip these operations, so it looks like this, and you can process it again, and you have your old document back. So this, obviously, this is how we do undo redo. But it goes beyond that. Because we have the separate transactions, like I said before, we can do um, more intelligent conflict resolution. We can do um, playback of edits and all that stuff. That's all still far into the future. Right now, we're just using it because it works nicely. So because we have a user interface that's ultimately rendered in HTML and needs to be structured, um, we need a tree of some sort. So we have a tr a node tree that we build from the linear data. And the tree nodes all know their lengths. They do not know where they are in the document, but they can derive that from their parents' lengths. And this makes it so that when you change something, you only need to change the length of the node, and you don't need to recompute all the offset positions of all the other nodes. So for instance, if I remove something, it's going to adjust the length and then the one that's parent and the one that's parent. And then, because, so we have a synchronizer that takes the changes that I made to the linear model and applies it to the node tree. And then the user interface, the node tree will, sorry, the node tree will emit events saying, I have changed. And the changes will be rendered in the user interface. That's basically the, that's basically the, the, lar the 40,000 foot view of what the editor's data model looks like. So um, a while back when we were working on the usability initiative, 
we were trying to make uh, a syntax highlighted uh, wiki text editor and we were using content editable uh, and we ran into a lot of problems and um, we, we kind of like learned the hard way that it's a very limited, buggy, difficult system to work with. Uh, about the same time, Google Docs switched from using content editable to um, inventing their own display surface that had like a blinking cursor that's like a div with a set timeout that's showing and hiding and you know, they're drawing their own selection and they're doing their own layout. And um, they did that because they felt like it was a way to be able to achieve the kind of features that they want to achieve. And so that, that was kind of inspiring for us that we felt like we, we could do this too. I mean, we don't have Google's manpower, but you know, we're inventive. So, um, so we kind of proceeded with this theory. And um, the, the, first, uh, the, the first thing that you figure out is that a browser does not let you um, just ask where a character is on the screen. So if you want to place a div that's a cursor um, in an arbitrary place that's supposed to be between characters, um, you have to get really clever on how to figure out where that cursor should actually be. If you're going to use the right arrow to move the cursor, where is the next character? Um, so uh, what, what we did is we actually had to lay out the text using a binary search algorithm um, manually, word by word, into a series of divs. Each div is a line of text. And uh, that, that, was, that, that worked pretty well because then what we could do is we could measure it, but we also had to make it really fast so you could resize the window. Um, and we also had to make it flow around objects and um, we had to make it so we could draw selection as a series of divs, uh, so it looks just like your nor normal native selection. And uh, we had to actually capture input by having a not visible, um, but, uh, but focused in, uh, text input that um, every time you clicked anywhere on the editor, it would focus that, and as you type, you're typing into that. And then, um, you know, zero milliseconds after the key down event, we would copy it in and insert it into the document. And this all seemed to work pretty well. It was, it was pretty inventive. It was pretty stable. This is what we released in December, if anybody took a peek at that. Um, and, uh, and generally, um, our computers were pretty happy. Everything was going well. But the problem was our mobile phones were not happy. We didn't have native selection. Um, it didn't really seem like we had a, had a clear way to support things like what happens when you press the space bar twice on an iPhone. Um, you know, we didn't have native spell check, uh, autocorrect, all, all, these, all these really important technologies, especially native selection, uh, were pretty much out of range for us. And so we kind of revisited this theory, uh, realizing that there was certain things that Content Editable had that we could never have. And even if, even if we could invent everything from scratch and not have to worry about the stupid browser bugs, we, we were still ultimately limited in what we could do. Um, so thankfully, at this time, Wikia um, had one engineer um, that, uh, that started experimenting with do, basically using the same whole stack that we were using, our data model, our user interface, but replacing just that top little bit, what we call ES, um, with a content editable implementation. And um, this turned out to work pretty well. And we, we ran both at the same time and kind of uh, let them fight and it won. And so we changed direction. And uh, this is kind of what we learned, that this is like a nice little Venn diagram that explains about what, what content editable gives you that's worth using, right? Almost nothing. Uh, the problem that most people run into when they use content editable is that they're using it as a data model. They're letting the browser be the controller. It's, it's a nightmare because everything's locked in and you're in this defensive position. You're constantly trying to figure out what just happened and there's not enough events. And uh, basically taking away all of its decision making capability was the trick. Speaking of events, it, you know, it is a black box, right? Content editable. So we, uh, all we know is we give it some HTML and the user does some stuff with their keyboard and their mouse, and you know, maybe they run an exec command, and then it spits back HTML out. That's, that's about all we know. And trying to get in there and figure out what's going on is, is, is unreliable, especially across browsers. Um, and, and the truth is, is that when you give a browser the HTML, you so much as press enter, and your document's totally thrashed. And 
the output is very, uh, is very unreliable. So the trick that they came up with this is, uh, that we've been developing on here is to just use it as only a display layer. And um, this seems like kind of a normal model view controller system. Uh, we're basically treating content editable kind of just like a terminal at the end of a pipeline. And, um, and th th this works pretty well. Um, but the, the trick here is really in the observation. Because like I said, there's not enough events. And so what we have to do with observation is do normal event stuff, um, but to fill in the gaps on an interval, we're constantly looking at what the document looks like compared to what it used to look like. And if we notice a change, then we build a transaction based on that, and then we may be rendered, depending if you're an IME, we maybe don't want to blow away that, that mode you're in. So, so th this technique here uh, has, ha has made it possible for the visual editor to not just work really well on desktop, but also we've opened the door to mobile. And so um, although we don't have like a mobile specific version yet, uh, that, that's now totally a possibility. And we, we believe strongly that that's a really important target, especially uh, with you know, tablets that this is, uh, if we build a visual editor that doesn't work on mobile devices, then eventually no one will use it because no one will be using desktops. <laughs> so it'll be kind of a waste of time. So um, if we have time, we could do a short demo and show them what it really looks like. Or maybe we're running short on time, and so I'll just tell you, if you go to um, mediawiki.org um, slash visual editor. All right, all right. I don't want to eat into everybody's time. Well, that's what I mean by everybody. <laughs> so um, this is uh, Bacon Ipsum. Uh, you know, I think that actually just people have been editing this already. Um, and so the editing experience now is that you click edit, and we transform the page into an editable document, uh, just right there in place. And I have a, a slug there. I can just convert. I can unlist this. No, I can't add an image yet. I can't do citations yet. Be patient. Be patient. So um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me change this to Frankfurters, because more Frankfurters is better than less Frankfurters. All right. And we'll say, added an S. And now we are back at the view, and it says Frankfurters. And that is how simple it is. So um, feel free to play with this. It's at mediawiki.org slash wiki slash visual editor. Colon welcome. Colon welcome. Yeah, there's a, it's a, basically it's an entire namespace. Feel free to create articles in there. Play with it. Do whatever you like. Um, report bugs. Uh, we, we pride ourselves on this system uh, producing extremely clean diffs. Um, and in fact, I'll show you what this particular diff looks like. Um, so one of the things when you're considering whether to report a bug or not, or, or what kind of things that we're interested in seeing, uh, you'll notice I, that's, that's no longer a list item. Um, and I added an S to Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurter, and then. This I, isn't you, S dude. This is someone else. To meatballs? That's somebody else? I added the S. Well, maybe? Oh, it, it's screwing with me. <laughs> so anyways, good times. But if you see, if you see, it's a live demo. Of course it's going to mess up. Um, but if you see differences in the diff, that's a very interesting bug to us. That's something we value a lot. Um, this, this entire system was. Well, actually, you, your team's buried down here because five other people were editing in the same. God minutes. dang you people. <laughs> Good times. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, so we care a lot about diffs. Any system that we deploy that makes it more difficult for people who are reviewing or system administrators, we consider to be unacceptable. So we, we care a lot about that. So let's get back to. The, uh, the few slides we have left here. Um, so yeah, so what's next? What's in the future? Um, we, we designed this whole system with uh, progressive enhancement in mind. Uh, she, you, know, you asked about an image, or maybe you might be interested in what happens when you have a citation. Basically, anything that comes into the editor that we don't already have special support for is still rendered normally, but it's, it's, it's locked out, so you just can't edit it. And it round trips cleanly. So well, over that's, time. That's how it's supposed to work, and that's how it's going to work very soon. Right now, it's still kind of broken. OK, yes, there are some bugs. But my point is, 
that um, we've designed a system so that it's okay for us to release earlier um, a limited but not going to break everything on Wikipedia version of the visual editor. Um, but we'd also have a lot of things that we're really looking forward to adding, and including an API which will help a lot of these features um, be added by people that aren't us. Because this is, this is a tall order and we're um, a decent sized team, but uh, we, we really want to see this stuff get developed. And Wikia has been um, putting a lot of resources in this project as well. And some of these things like uh, maybe embedding a YouTube video or maybe more of a priority for them than us. Uh, but we, we're really excited to see all kinds of extensions to the visual editor uh, so that it can be the editor for the web in general, um, not just for Wikimedia. And that will mean that there was a larger community behind this very ambitious project. And um, speaking of other platforms, there's no reason. This is completely standalone software right now. And you know we do have a MediaWiki extension that integrates it, but we also have a standalone HTML demo um, when you check out the repo that does not need MediaWiki at all. And this is really important because this can be the same editor that we use on WordPress, which I believe that this is a superior editor, at least it will be soon. Um, and you can use this on forums. And if this is the editor for the web, it's HTML in, HTML out, but it's clean and it's powerful. So I really look forward to this being the new editor for the, for the internet in general. <laughs> It'll be awesome. So speaking of getting involved, uh, clone a repository. Um, oh yeah, this is not true anymore. We should update that. We should there is no that. hacker lounge. We will not be there at 6:30. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyways, go to our go to our um, go to our site. Learn more. There's actually a lot of documentation. Every function has a lot of documentation. There's documentation online. Um, we we really want people to get involved, and we really look forward to um, building a large development community around this project. And of course, we're also, we also look forward to more people um, working with us on a paid basis. So Wikimedia has job openings, which you should, be, which you should totally feel free to look at. Um, they're all listed on jobs at wikimedia.org. Yeah, they're not just visual editor jobs. Not just visual editor <laughs> jobs, basically everything. So uh, thank you. Yeah, and again, don't swing by the Hacker Lounge. We won't be there. <laughs> Do we have any time for some questions quickly? Eric, I'm looking for you to nod wherever you are. Maybe, all right, just a few. Um, I don't know if we have wireless mics anywhere. I'll just repeat the question, if there are any. Any questions? Over there, sorry, okay, you. Can we anticipate a release timeline? Can we anticipate a release timeline? Um, so, Probably later this year, early next, we're gonna roll this out in a more robust way on some wikis um, in their like main namespace, not like an isolated namespace that has kind of these limited permissions for editing. Um, and it, pending that going well, um, sometime next year, we're hoping for a, um, a release on Wikipedia. Um, like I said, it may not be completely full featured at the time, but it shouldn't break Wikipedia either, and common tasks will be insanely easier to do. What's that? Non-Latin languages. Of course. Of course. Yeah, we're working with the internationalization team. They've already written a lot of specs from right to left and different input methods and things that we need to support. And uh, yes, um, every piece of software that the Wikimedia Foundation writes is um, like at we? least supposed to be fully internationalized. And um, at least the extension here is fully internationalized. It's already translated into a, a whole bunch of languages. And um, that's definitely a top priority. I think there might currently be bugs with inputting non-Latin text. I'm not entirely sure, but if there are, we will fix it. Um, when, when we hacked up CE in February, um, that was one of the things that they had that the Wikia guys, who were like kind of racing um, the uh, the Wikimedia guys in, in implementations, that they had to prove that they could do IME, and they had it working excellent. Um, it, we had a tight release deadline and we wanted to get something out so people could play with it. Um, so that didn't make it into this release, but we do have a method for getting robust support for IME in a variety of, a variety of ways and that's, that's gonna be coming soon. We're on a two week release schedule now, um, so it's not gonna be like these huge 
um, gaps in time before you see anything. But um, as far as changing where it's deployed, that, those will be longer time frames. This guy? Yes. So the question was, have we thought about APIs for extension developers for like references, images, and stuff? Absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll try and answer this quickly because we're short on time, but there, there's two things. One is, yes, we care about that a lot. It's a total requirement, and we're gonna have a very robust, well-documented API, and the way that we're gonna guarantee it's robust is because we are going to make so all of the features that we implement use the API, that there will be no secret backdoor that we use. And um, so anything that we were able to do, anybody else could do too. All right, well let's, uh, one more question and then we'll go to Eric. That's right. So, okay, so. The question was, uh, what, it's, it's cool that you can handle info boxes and stuff out of the box, but what about places where there's unbalanced wiki text and template where, for instance, you have one template opening a table tag and the other template closing a table tag? So, kind of what I, what I mentioned before, and this will apply, that would be considered something that our editor kind of thinks is a little bit insane. And um, we'll see, like, maybe there's, this is really common, there'll be a, a table where you have one template that opens it, one template that closes it, a bunch of templates mixed in with wiki text that generate the rows. That will all, when we get it, we just see this is a bunch of stuff that was at least partially generated and we're just gonna treat it like a black box. And in time, we will come up with really clever ways to break it up and be able to make it so you can edit the actual parameters. But in the, in the short term, complex um, and irregular use of templates um, is just gonna kinda turn bits of the document off from visual editing so that we can be safe and make sure we can run trip it okay. All right, so thank you, uh, we'll switch to Eric now. This is Eric Miller. I'm the uh, VP of Engineering and Product of the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, as you may have seen uh, this morning, I've also been involved in Wikipedia for a fairly long time. Um, in Wikimania, I usually uh, um, you know, give a presentation on some of the, the uh, things that are a little bit further in the future. Uh, so I try not to talk about the stuff that's right around the corner, but uh, about some ideas that are on my mind and some of the uh, horizons that we're thinking about. And uh, the topic of uh, this presentation is Wikimedia as a social network, which I'm sure is going to be uh, somewhat controversial, which is always fun. Um, so I want to just ask uh, who in this audience is on Facebook? Okay, so that's pretty good. So who in this audience is friends with this guy? <laughs> okay, so that, that's not too bad. So, so when people think about social networks, uh, they think about Facebook. And so it's not a surprise that when people talk about Wikipedia as a social network, the first response is often, no, 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 no. We're not like Facebook, we're not like that. Because Facebook is about friendship, it's about who you know, who you are, what you care about, it's about sharing pictures of cats, it's about sharing pictures of babies, it's about sharing memes, it's about what's happening in your life. And Wikipedia is kind of about other types of things. So this is a page in Wikipedia about organized labor. And if you're thinking about organized labor, uh, you're not thinking about social networking, you're not thinking about friends, you're not thinking about, oh, this is kind of like Facebook. But it kind of is. And I'm gonna talk about how that is. So you actually see people on this page. They just don't stand out as much. But this is the Wiki Project Organized Labor, which is a place where people meet and organize articles about organized labor, unions, and so forth. And wiki projects are a very fundamental organizing tool in Wikipedia. There are many, many thousands of these pages in Wikipedia that are used to organize work around a specific topic. Can I ask who in this audience is a member of a wiki project in Wikipedia? So look around you. Like This is a large group of people. People sign up for these wiki projects. So how are wiki projects related to social networking? Well, I hope you can see this, uh, and, and, and what you see here are two types of graphs. Uh, so when we think about social networking, we often think about modeling uh, them as a graph, and this is probably the most technical slide that I have. So, <laughs> um, the, the social graph that you see uh, at the top 
Uh, that's basically the way you can model a social network like Facebook. Like, I know this person, this person knows this other person, and so on. And so that's one way to build connections. It's basically centered around your universe of people that you already know. And that's very much the central organizing principle of Facebook. It's the people I know, the friends I've made, and what they care about and what I care about. And sometimes through a network like Facebook, I discover other people, but primarily I start by, I know this person, uh, or um, this, is part, this, this person is part of my family even, and I connect with them. But there are other social networks that are more focused on connecting people with things they care about. The person is central, and you find and discover things that you care about. I care about bicycles, or I care about mountains, or I care about Jimi Hendrix, or whatever. And you can then use that information to connect with other people who care about the same things. And you can ask them questions, they can ask you questions. That type of social networking is not as common in Facebook, although Facebook is trying to build a very strong interest graph. For example, when you like a page on Facebook, that's one way of enriching the interest graph that's underlying Facebook. But it is not the central organizing mechanism of Facebook. But it's the central organizing mechanism of some other sites. An example of a site that uses a very strong interest graph as a central organizing, uh, organizing mechanism is a site called Quora. Can I ask who's familiar with Quora.com? So I would say about a quarter of the audience. So Quora is a fairly popular site now. Uh, it was actually created, co-founded by the former CTO of Facebook. And uh, the idea behind Quora is to leverage many of the principles of social networking for a purpose, and the purpose uh, that Quora is designed to serve is to answer questions. So you can think of it as kind of Yahoo Answers on steroids. And it really is doing a very good job at what it does. Uh, so in the moment you sign up on Quora, you do the usual nonsense of setting up your friends, or uh, it might help you import some of the friends from the social networks you're already in. But one of the more interesting things that um, happens very soon after you sign up is either you list some things you're interested in, or what's even more exciting is that other people give things to you that they think you're interested in. So the moment I set up my account on Quora, and I noticed that Pavel Richter, uh, the executive director of Wikimedia Germany, is following me on Quora, I can say, hey, Pavel, you know about Wikipedia here. Uh, this is a topic for you. Or I can say, oh, well, I, I went out drinking uh, last night with Pavel, and he knows a lot about German beer. So I'm, I'm going to give that topic to him uh, as well. So uh, I can actually help enrich other people's experience, which is a very powerful idea. And another central theme in Quora is the feed. Uh, just like in Facebook and on pretty much every social network on the planet, the feed is sort of the main entry point for you as a user. It's where everything happens. But contrary to Facebook, I'm not seeing pictures of babies or memes or cats. I am seeing questions that people are answering. I'm seeing very rich intellectual discussions that are occurring that are related to the interests that I have identified or that others have identified for me. This is actually a very hybrid feed. Some of the stuff is here because these are people I know and some of it is here because they are topics that I care about. So I think Quora is using these techniques very effectively. It actually even has elements of wiki editing uh, integrated with this as well. But if we compare some of these paradigms with what, the, what is actually happening in Wikipedia, I think we see where the areas are where we can learn from sites like Quora and even from sites like Facebook. So this is an actual wiki project page, and this is a typical sign-up sheet for a wiki project page. So what you see here, if you can't read it, in the, in the lower half of the screen is the list of participants, the usernames of people who've signed up for this particular wiki project. So if you're not among the people in the room who raised their hands earlier when I asked who's part of a wiki project, the moment you add your name to this list, you're part of a wiki project. That is all there is to it, but it is a list in wiki markup. You have to add your four tildes, the usual uh, wiki nonsense that you have to do in order to uh, be successful in Wikipedia. And it is also not the only way that you can identify yourself as a member of a wiki project. There are many different ways to do so. Um, you could add a user box to your user page. You could add a category to your user page. 
it is not just one mechanism. And in fact, if you're trying to find uh, who are the people who are in, in this wiki project, you'll get an incomplete list if you just look at this list. And this is a screenshot of the talk page for the article um, uh, Replicas of the Statue of Liberty, which is one of the articles that uh, has the most wiki projects associated with them. And what happens is that uh, people who are part of a wiki project identify articles that are within the scope of that wiki project. So they tag them and they say, okay, this is related to what we care about. So if you're in military history, you find all the articles about mil military history and tag them on the talk page as about military history. And so in this case, because they're replicas of the Statue of Liberty in all these different countries, uh, Argentina, Australia, Austria, Brazil, China, etc., they've all added their little wiki project banner to the talk page. And so you've got like 30 stacked together. These, these are literally the mechanics of um, basically managing the interest graph in Wikipedia. Are using templates, using top pages, manually editing. There's no structured data underneath this with the exception of the category graph in Wikipedia. And the other mechanics uh, that are used for managing wiki projects uh, are things like bots, automated scripts and tools uh, that keep updating pages, uh, updating categories uh, once a certain event has occurred. And so very carefully curated wiki projects, this is the wiki project military history uh, actually, if I remember correctly, um, have like very, very well curated backlogs, a list of things that you can do, categories you know, of, of articles that need help, um, that you can jump into and, and do stuff with. But in order to get that level of organization into a wiki project, you have to do a lot of work. There's nothing that the software like just does for you. You want to start a wiki project, you've got to learn how all this stuff works, you've got to learn how to use categories, you've got to learn which bots to use, you've got to learn what templates to use, and then maybe you can set up something that's halfway effective for the kinds of people who already know how to navigate these very complex organizational structures. The other element of wiki projects is talking to people. And so a lot of things that uh, are occurring in the context of wiki projects are things like collaborations of the week, contests. And so people are sending these messages to members of a wiki project and saying, uh, there's a contest going on, uh, we're trying to improve this article, or thank you for participating in this event that, that was just held. And again, there's nothing in the software that says, here's how you do this. You have to manually find your way around either by manually going to all the talk pages of the participants and copying and pasting the same message over and over again, or using a bot, or using some kind of crafty tool. Like, there's nothing that makes it easy. And uh, in this particular wiki project, I, I think it was uh, the aviation one, um, I looked at uh, some talk pages and some members, and in the course of several years, this was actually the only message I found that had been sent to members. So it's very often the case that this just doesn't happen because it is so crafty and it requires so much effort to actually communicate with the Wiki Project's members. So Jonathan Morgan has done a ton of research into Wiki Projects uh, uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation and some of it is on Meta if you search Meta for Wiki Projects. And this is a graph that uh, he created that basically shows the uh, membership and Wiki Projects. Uh, this graph, uh, of, of all the research uh, that I've looked at, I found this graph interesting for two reasons because it tells two important stories. One story is that the participation in Wiki Project generally fol follows the overall trend in Wikipedia. It doesn't drive or change or challenge the dynamic of the uh, decline in active participation in Wikipedia. It follows it. And the other uh, part of the story is that the green line at the bottom uh, shows you the number of new Wikipedians that join Wiki Projects every month. And new Wikipedia is here defined as someone who's actually made up to 100 edits. So that's actually quite a few edits if you think about it. Your registered users, you have made up to 100 edits. And even if you look at that group, that group is much, much, much smaller than the number of experienced Wikipedians who join Wiki Projects. People with more than 100 edits. And this is an important part of the story because the mechanics of wiki projects are so complicated that people typically don't discover them early in their life cycle as a Wikipedian. Uh, they typically discover them fairly late. Uh, they don't understand yet what they're doing when they're starting in Wikipedia and they have no idea what a wiki project could possibly be and how they could interact with it. 
And when they do discover, they don't really know what's going on around them. They don't know yet how talk pages work. So they're not very effective as a tool for new users. So there's this very powerful dynamic in Wikipedia. These wiki projects are an incredibly powerful idea, if you think about it, because they are the social and the interest graph in Wikipedia. It's the people and the things they care about. It could be a very powerful motor, but they're not because they are technologically not supported. So I'm just going to share some sketches with you, and they're not intended to be anything other than that, and hopefully stimulate some conversation uh, about what we could do in order to better support wiki projects. This is a very simple idea, and the, the, the sort of first question that I think we want to ask um, is how do people come into contact with wiki projects? Right now there's this mechanism of these stacked templates on talk pages. If you actually compare the statistics between page views on an article page and page views on a talk page, there's like an orders of magnitude difference. People do not click on talk pages. They don't understand what they are. They don't discover them until fairly late in their life cycle as Wikipedians. So one question that we may want to ask is maybe there's an, a type of invitation that we can use after a person has made an edit, either in a general case or in a specific case, like on a very specific page that's in scope of a certain wiki project, uh, after they've already made lots of relevant changes in that domain. And we can just tell them through the software, hey, there's a wiki project that you might want to be a part of. And that should be an instantaneous action. It shouldn't be an action that requires signing up on a page. It should be as simple as clicking a button. But this is a page that contains within it some, some important ideas about how wiki projects themselves could be organized. So if you remember the, the earlier organized labor uh, wiki project uh, page that I showed you and some of the others, You'll remember that they were all extremely text heavy, extremely detail heavy, and they made it very hard to actually start doing anything. So if we could support wiki projects with software, I think the first question we want to ask is, what should that user experience look like? And then reverse engineer, how can we create that user experience? And I think the user experience that we want is one where when you get in contact with a wiki project, it's something that feels alive and rich and exciting and personal. And it's a place where you find people who care about the same things that you care about and you think, wow, I didn't think anyone cared about those things. I should be a part of this. So there are some ideas I think that we can actually take from uh, sites like Facebook or Pinterest or others uh, that are very visually driven. Uh, so wiki projects are extremely text heavy. I, I, in general, I think Wikipedia needs to adopt a much more strongly visual experience. And so to have a very strong photo or illustration as being a part of almost every wiki project is, I think, something that we should encourage. But the other part is how, how do we create an experience that is dynamic? So the notion that we actually have a feed of, of, of activity uh, that shows me something that's recently happened that's relevant to this domain, uh, this domain in this case, uh, aircraft. So new members that have joined the project, a new newsletter that has been published, a new collaboration of the week that's been announced, uh, similar things that I can engage with, I can click on links and I can start doing things. One of the ideas that you find in Facebook is the notion of friend suggestions. And the way Facebook does this is very psychologically interesting. When they suggest friends for you to add to your social network, they give you about three at a time. And when you mouse over the suggestions, you can click them away if you don't like them. This is very clever because it reduces the amount of cognitive attention that you initially have to invest in order to engage. So it says, hey, here's a little bit of an entry. Um, if you want to think about adding more friends, just click one uh, link and you're done. Or click it away if it's not the right thing. It draws you in. And we do the opposite everywhere in Wikipedia. We do the exact opposite. We do cognitive overload everywhere. Here's a backlog of 6,000 things that you can do. Here are 10 million articles that you could work on. Like, it's the exact opposite approach. It doesn't actually work. Wikipedians have the tendency to think, if, if something doesn't work, let's add a little bit more text. If it's still not clear, more text would certainly be a good idea. So, <laughs> We have to fight that tendency. We have to simplify. We have to drive towards 
what is the first entry point that we can offer? And so the idea is here, why don't we offer a list of three tasks, copy edit an article or add an image and find a source, have that driven by recent tags that have been added by users, have that driven by some heuristics. And then if you want to, you can start doing stuff. So even in this page, there are lots of assumptions about the mechanics of how this would work because in order to have a news feed, you have to have mechanisms for feeding it. So in order to have a news feed, you have to have heuristics that analyze things that are going on in the system. You may have to have the notion of a wiki project administrator who can post right away uh, or can promote and moderate posts that others make to the feed. And in order to have things like suggestions, you have to evaluate tags that are being added to article. You have to use scoring and other heuristics to understand what a good suggestion for this particular user would look like. In order to make joining as simple as one click, you actually have to have an interest graph. You actually have to connect the user with the things they care about at the database level. And you have to use that information. So there are lots of dependencies that are inherent in some of these ideas. And if we look at the suggestions notion in particular, one of the things that we can uh, experiment with is the notion of microtasks, which is the idea that once you start doing a certain thing, maybe you want to do more of that same thing. So if you start copy editing articles, why not give the user a simple navigational structure that makes it easy for them to just keep copy editing, to pull the next article. So again, very limited cognitive overhead required to engage in something that you care about. Those, I think, are the, the goals that we should drive towards. And if you really want to start talking about Facebook and social media, I think the, the comments that I often hear are things like, why doesn't Wikipedia do things like Facebook Connect? Or why doesn't Wikipedia do things like um, integrating your friends into Wikipedia? I actually think those are not the most powerful ideas. I think the more powerful ideas are around carrying Wikipedia into social media are around carrying your interests and your passion into Twitter and into Facebook and saying, I'm a member of this project, I just uploaded a picture, I just shared something, I just built something, and thereby saying to your friends, if you happen to be in that same interest graph as I am, then you can come join a wiki project. So the notion of making it very easy to share two social networks, I think is more powerful in many ways than the notion of trying to bring the social media uh, into Wikipedia. So this was the future, and how do we get to that future? We did a little bit of uh, analysis at the Wikimedia Foundation and thinking about these engagement features and how they relate to each other. So Trevor talked about the editor, which is the crucial, fundamental component that we need to get right. The editor is a must-do thing. That's why we consider the highest priority project of the Wikimedia Foundation right now. I'm ready to kill any other project that we have underway in order to make sure that the visual editor succeeds. It's not because it's going to solve all the world's problems, it's because we know we have to do it. It's the largest area of known that we have. But there are some less obvious areas, like the ones that I've just talked about, but other, other types of improvements, like better mechanisms for expressing gratitude, reputation, social sharing features that we probably also need to experiment with and need to build. But almost all of those features share some dependencies. And the dependencies are two very strong ones. And the first one is notifications. Notifications is a big word for a very small but important thing. Facebook, Quora, or any other site that you engage with socially talks to you all the time. It talks to you by email, it talks to you on the site, it talks to you in a different feed, it talks to you in many, many different ways. And that's the way you keep coming back. Wikipedia doesn't talk to you. Wikipedia sends you a message from a sender called Media Wiki Mail saying user talk page so-and-so has been modified on X date. That's what a notification looks like in Wikipedia. It doesn't have an on Wiki notification system except for a big yellow bar that says you have new messages. So, there's nothing in Wikipedia that resembles a modern infrastructure for actually sending information to the user about what's going on. 
So Brandon in his next talk is going to go into that and we have two important projects that relate to notification and messaging. They're called Echo and Flow and they're actually projects that we're going into now. And the other big dependency is identity. When we're talking about wiki projects, a lot of what we're talking about is I as a person, as a human being, have an identity. I have interests, I have affiliations and I need to bring those into a site like Wikipedia. And Wikipedia has a very weak notion of identity right now. When you sign up, you've got a username, don't even have to have an email address, and you have a password. And everything beyond that is Wikitext. It doesn't have a strong structured notion of identity, and certainly doesn't have something as rich as a structured interest graph that you can follow and leverage to build software. So that's going to be a big area for us to actually build architecture and infrastructure to support. But then we can explore ideas like affiliation, which is uh, the code word, if you will, that we use for uh, wiki projects and other uh, means to express interest. And we can explore things like microtasks, uh, which is the notion of doing a very small thing but making that very easy and specializing tools for it. So I hope that gives you a, an overview and I'm, I'm very excited uh, that we're now as the Wikimedia Foundation in position to actually build some of these technologies we've, we've got really uh, really solid engineers and designers, and you're going to uh, hear from one of them in a few minutes. Thank you so much. Any uh, comments or questions? Uh, I think we have to keep it pretty quick. How are we doing for time? Okay, two questions. And we're going to go a little bit over, if that's okay. Sven. Vince, you invited me to heckle you last Yay! Um, every couple of weeks, someone proposes to do something linking Wikipedia to Facebook. And it becomes a bitterly divided thing where half of the community says, yes, we want this very much. And half the community says, if you do this, we will burn your house down and then leave. Um, and so, how do you reconcile that there is a large community of people that see, please do not take photos of me, um, that see um, anything moving towards Facebook as being really, really bad, with that if you don't do something to make people stop feeling like they're on small islands by themselves, they will eventually all leave? That's actually a very, very good question, and I, I do think about it a lot. And my view on this is that there, frankly, there are a lot of very stupid ideas when it comes to Wikipedia and social media. There are a lot of really stupid ideas. And that's because people take a look at things like Facebook, they take their experience from sites like Facebook, and they often think like, okay, why, why, why can't I find those buttons here? Why can't I find those mechanisms here? Wikipedia is very alien to me. So Wikipedia is alien because it doesn't build on a lot of known paradigms that people understand. And so it's a normal reaction or a normal response to say, why didn't you add a like button? Or why didn't you add a share feature here? Or why didn't you make a Facebook Connect link over here? And frankly, we're also running a little bit uh, uh, in, a, in a continuing tension and conflict between this desire to modernize and on the other hand, the fact that Wikipedia has very strong ideals around things like privacy. And uh, Facebook Connect is like a privacy invading monster and so are many other uh, potential ways to integrate. So we have to be very cautious and very uh, intellectually honest in these discussions. And I think the, the right response isn't simply, uh, oh, well, let's do Facebook Connect and let's add a share button and a like button. And uh, I think the right response is actually to look very carefully and to recognize that we are a social network, uh, but we are a purpose-driven social network. We have a mission, we have a scope, we have goals. We're not here to add features just for the sake of making it easier to like things or share things. We're here to add features for the, sh uh, for the sake of making it easier to build the best and most amazing encyclopedia on the planet. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. One more. The, uh, the idea of Wicked Projects is a very good one. There, I'm a member of a military history project, which is pretty active. It's you know, fun to be in. But then, there are, for every military history project or even a middling one, um, there are 10 or 20 completely inactive Wicked Projects, which your ideas you're presenting here 
Um, how are you going to direct users to which are projects that are active versus inactive? That, that's a good question. My hope is that if we build better features for wiki project administrators, then metrics and tools that we can use to monitor activity are going to be a fairly natural way to connect to that. One problem right now is that even getting simple activity data is very hard due to the inherent lack of structure and software support for what's going on in wiki projects right now. But if we have systems for notifications and feeds and similar technology support, then it becomes a lot more straightforward to say, okay, do not suggest this wiki project if this metric is smaller than X. Like once you actually have the support in the technology, you can make smarter decisions. So we're gonna have to uh, cut this a little bit short. Um, thank you so much for attending this session and I hope you stay on for the next one. We call Wikipedia in the year 2015. Eric made a comment earlier about we had this little retreat. We sat around and had this conversation about what should we be doing? Where should we be going? What is important? And clearly the visual editor is, like he said, one of our top priorities, but there are other things too. And these things all together create kind of a, a, a more core vision. So uh, what we want to talk about is a set of projects that sort of wrap together. And Echo and Flow are two of them. But the most important thing we want to start is more Kirk, less Spock, uh, which is also so a mo less. Um, <laughs> You, you know what, just do what you need to do, man. I'm just going to start talking. Uh, <laughs> I got a new watch. If I reboot it, oh boy. The first project we talked about is this thing called Agora. Now, uh, I have a fanatical uh, love of naming, just close everything. A uh, love of uh, Greek terms and so forth and code names because I think we we have our really boring naming convention. Anyway, Agora means um, the uh, center place of knowledge and learning in ancient Greek towns. And I, that was a dis suggestion from one of our designers, Manafa Saf. He's a brilliant guy. Um, so what is Agora? Agora is the design team, six of us. Uh, coming together and actually applying real thought to things like color and making a single fist. That's what that's called. It's called fist, my design fist. Uh, we're going to say like, okay, blue means this, green means that, red means this. These are the reds we're going to use. These are the blues we're going to use. These are the grays we're going to use. Here's how we're going to use color. What fonts we're going to use, how we're going to use fonts, the kinds of white space we're going to have. Just a general plan because right now there isn't one. Um, and that's, that's a big part of what's going on. So you can think of that as like the style system going forward. See, now I would have a really pretty picture, but I don't. All right. Click on my cat. Just a sec. So the future, the projects, Agora, Athena, Echo, Flow, Global Profile. And then we're going to talk a bit about usage modes because these are important things to know. Agora, I just told you about that. So we're gonna skip this one. Now Athena, Athena is a rethinking. Um, we have, I know a lot of you guys love Monobook. Everybody loves Monobook, right? Everybody loves Vector. But there are some problems that were interaction problems, fundamental interaction problems, that were introduced eight years ago. And they've just flowed through. And we kind of need to fix that forever. Mostly it has to do with associations. So if you look at your standard page, an article, uh, we have a conflation of a tab and sub-tab problem. There's too many tabs that are associated with something that aren't actually associated with something else. Half of your actions on a page are included in this toolbox, which is, of course, closed by default. Uh, a couple other things along these lines. There's not a lot of... Uh, users who get that there are tabs, that's, that's kind of a problem. We, we're going to deal with that. We're going to come forward in time and we're going to focus on content. This is part of that modes thing that we're going to talk about in a bit. But we're going to basically take everything that's confusing and doesn't make sense or that we don't want people to see. You know, like 
the help portal. I don't ever want people to go there because it's hellish. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we're going to bury that. Uh, this is kind of where we're thinking of going. We're going to update content. It's going to be about content. It's going to be progressive. It's based around the mobile designs as we're, they're being worked on. So in theory, it's the exact same experience, just maybe with fewer pictures. Uh, we're going to like, you know, emphasize the content that we have, slideshows, all sorts and kinds of stuff. And we're going to basically act like it's the year 2015. Big blue edit button. Where's Asara? I know she hates that. So, uh, yeah, let's make sure that people understand that they can edit. Let's talk to them in real language. I mean, what does history mean to a new user? Well, I mean, the article history, yeah, that, that, that's true, but telling me when it was updated is more important, I think. So I'm just, I'm just rapid fire, so, because we don't have a lot of time. Echo and flow, you guys see Hustle and Flow? You know the movie? Yeah, that's, that's what I think of every time I see it, is this Echo and Flow thing. Echo is a global cross wiki notification system. It is more than just your talk page, it is everything. We're gonna be, it's gonna be crucial for pretty much everything that we wanna do, we need to have this. It basically will become your global watch list. That's a side benefit. Here you go. Brian Viber left a message for me on my talk page on the English Wikipedia, and Eloquence invited me to join heavy, Wiki Project Heavy Metal. And at the same time, he also left a comment on the mood bar discussion on Media Wiki. That happens on every wiki. Right there. Bam. We're just going to go get them all. So when your watch list, when somebody modifies something that you care about on Meta, the Village Pump, you'll know. This, it, it, we will be able to public, publicize to it. So like, the signpost, instead of a bot coming around and like leaving you a note, it'll just send you a notification. Bam. You're subscribed to it. Same with your wiki projects, like what Eric was talking about. Hey, we need somebody who wants to do this. Let's send out a, a request to the people who match these criteria. Bam, there you go, pow. It's kind of important. Flow then, and again, I'm just gonna, uh, questions later. Flow is, uh, <laughs> it's getting rid of user talk pages, guys. Um, we have lots of problems with user talk pages. One of the biggest ones, especially, that new users have is, is they go, uh, who do I, who do I, where do I leave my message? I mean, whose talk page owns this? Do I leave it on mine? Do I put it on yours? Where, where's the responses go? These things are problematic. Uh, we lose more users that way. But the other thing is, is they don't even know that they've had this message. So, you know, that's another problem in and of itself. Flow is a feed. It's more than a talk page, though. It's a... Uh, it is Eric's feed in a way. It is a very simple, non-threaded, I'm not using the word liquid threads. It is not liquid threads. Uh, and it's not, it, user interactions are very simple. They're always one to one, maybe one to three. They're tap, 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 tap. You don't have to do indentation. We don't have to worry about that for these types of things. So we got this. We have a way to like know when you watch it. We have a way to know when you've read it. We can tell you when new things are coming. You can go find them, search them, do whatever, structured data. Flow eventually becomes something more important than that. It's like we're going to start getting uh, watch list notifications in here, say, 13 edits to this page since you last saw them. Click here to view the diffs. So and so invited you to join this thing. There's a new request for this. So your vision of this and everybody else's vision of your page are going to be slightly different. It just mostly has to do with privacy and like, I'm not going to be able to see your watch list like I can't now, but, you know, I'll be able to see where you interact. This conversation right here would exist on three talk pages, or should, Andrew's, mine, Philippe's, because Philippe's talking to it. But maybe if somebody else decides to just watch it, they're mentoring a kid, something along those lines, they just start watching their pages. Well, now those, pa those conversations are going to start flowing up in there, too. It's your, it's your interest graph. I have no idea what I'm supposed to talk about next. Global profile. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, structured profile data, this is like the essential piece that we need to have in place before we can do the wiki projects thing. Global profile is, is pretty awesome in terms of what it could do. Uh, it, it crosses the line with, um, with wiki data in some ways. You can think of it as like wiki data for people. Uh, you have one 
profile. And it's going to heap information about you like, oh, these are the things I'm interested in. These are the projects I'm on. These are the languages I speak. These are the skills I have. You know, I have high Photoshop, and I'm fluent in English, and I don't speak Spanish for crap. But it's also configurable because different people are different people. Uh, so if you like say, we, 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 it's built around the idea of widgets, like block widgets. There's uh, widgets that are free text, standard wiki text, and then there's ones that's like, oh, just show my recent file uploads or show the contributions that I had. These are the things I'm proud of. We actually found out this weird, exp through a different thing, uh, test, we found that users new users at least, the first time they ever go to somebody's user page, the number one thing that they're looking for is what you've done. They don't care about anything else. They, they want to know what you did. And I think that's kind of neat. And I think we should start you know, bringing that up. This is your identity. Your identity is part of the project. You, you're, you're here because you're proud of it. So let's show it off. So, you know, it helps you curate your own stuff, curate your life. And now we're going to talk about modes. So we have a really complex and cluttered interface. Uh, but when it comes down to it, people do three primary things. They either read, they edit, or they curate. So let's actually flip those around. Reading is very simple. It's just sim minimal controls. You actually really don't need half of the controls that Wikipedia has unless you're logged in or you're intending to edit. So why give them to you at that point in time? We're going to hold that off. We're going to create edit modes so that you can update things, sections, documents, wiki data, whatever. You want to upload a photo, this is how you do it. You enter the edit mode some way, and then that's, that does that for you. And then finally, curation mode. Uh, this is where we want to do fast tip, 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 tip. We're going to go through this. We've got 3,000 pages to view today and see which ones we want to delete. Um, we actually already have this thing coming. You're going to see it in a couple months with page curation tools, uh, the page triage extension. This is a little toolbar that we have that will actually come up after you enter curation mode, and it floats along the side of your pages and as, you, as you do page patrolling, and you can like tag them, mark them for deletion, mark them as patrolled. You can send wiki love, skip it, whatever. You know, and it's lightning fast. It's designed for tablets. Tap, 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 because this is the kind of thing that you, know, you could do on a bus. And it's also supposed to teach you about things. Kind of a goofy screenshot. Um, but like it'll tell you, like, oh, well, this is what an orphan tag means. And here's the kind of things that you want to do. And it's got keyboard accelerators, which is pretty nice, too. And that, yeah, that's it. OK. Now, I know there are questions. So who's first? Mike Schwartz. The 2015 part of the title came from uh, when we were in the retreat, we wanted to say what is the time frame that we could get a lot of the major things done in. Uh, it's like if we had a team of like, well, yours, you know, maybe we would say Wikipedia 2013, but no. Uh, we have uh, in the pipeline and the, 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 the blocks, the blocks of development, the cycles that we assumed we could have, we could get most of this stuff done in three years. And that, that's where that, that comes from. Sven. Okay, so um, Vector came out, and there's still a horde of people that literally play the mono book, and yes. we take that to their grave. How many of the features you unveil today will not work properly if people don't switch over to Athena? No, it's not, it's not even a question. It's not. So the question is, how many, how many features are we developing that will not work if we don't switch to Athena? That's not a thing. That We know that that ball doesn't that dog don't hunt. Uh, there are features that we are de showing today that will not work if you use IE6 uh, and things along those lines. But uh, yeah, we support, you know, we have a sort of a mandate to support the top three, like absolutely on launch. And then um, things like, the, where there's only like five people who use it, we're not really too concerned about that, but that doesn't mean we won't make sure it works. In theory, none of this stuff requires a specific skin. So, that's that. Uh, you, you. Mm -hmm. 
Well, okay, so if you remove the user talk page, where do these messages and, and log things go? Uh, they, they go into the same, they, they, they just become flow documents or flow pages, that's all. I mean, uh, it, 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 we, can, we can easily put a hook in so that when something gets saved to the user talk page, it just looks in, creates a, a flow page instead. So that's implementation details, and we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're definitely thinking about these sort of things. So we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, you. Excuse me. Article talk pages. So no, article talk pages at this point in time are not on the on the menu for this. Um, the reason is is that again the the interaction model on an article talk page is usually seven times more complex than just a user to user interaction. Huh? Yeah, here, Eric wants to add to a response on talk pages. So the, the other thing about uh, talk pages is uh, when we uh, started thinking about how we can improve talk pages, one of the first results of that was the liquid threads extension. Actually, uh, one of the things that's notable about it is that it was just built by a single developer who's actually, I think, here, Andrew. Andrew, stand up. Hello. Yay. So uh, given that it was just one guy while he was uh, at university working on it, I think it's pretty darn impressive, but it is also very incomplete. Um, but the other thing about uh, talk page discussions is um, that as we build the visual editor, I think we want to really seriously reflect on how discussions occur and among who. If you look at uh, collaboration and systems like Google Docs, you will see uh, that they have adopted different kinds of paradigms. So you will see things like margin notes, resolution of comments, and other workflows that are highly optimized and highly responsive. And those workflows are not present in talk pages as they exist today. And as we start thinking about the next version of discussion and messaging on articles, I think we need to take into account that it doesn't need to necessarily look like a forum. It may look like a margin for certain use cases. It may look like a feed for certain use cases. We have to reset some of our assumptions about how discussions ought to work. Groove. Okay. Next, who's? Is that you? Yes. Okay, what, what, what's the roadmap? Um, the 2015 roadmap goes like this, curation toolbar first. That will be within two months. Two months, Fabrice? Two months. Uh, after that we go to notifications, the Echo project. Echo is, is that, then it's flow, and then global profile. Now global profile, from a technical standpoint, a lot of that can be implemented at the same time as other things, so we're gonna see what happens with that. After that would be, uh, the, the talk, the, the, the project, wiki project support. Uh, skinning stuff, that's kind of like a up in the air conversation. Um, there's uh, two guys that are on the team who are very keen on doing so, um, and like they're kind of doing it in their spare time. So who knows? You know, that one is, is not officially slated right now. Privacy concerns regarding global profile. Yes. Absolutely. So the thing with the with the with the the you don't have to have it. That is really what it comes down to. No one piece of data is required to be filled out, or even used. So uh, the privacy policy on that is whatever you decide to tell people, you're telling people. And if you don't want to tell people something, you're not telling people something. Does that answer your question? I don't see how we would, I don't think we have a track record of making that de facto required, but um, okay, yeah, I, I mean, I can see social pressures making that more of a thing than um, a foundation like word thing. I can't imagine one of the projects uh, voting consensus wise to say that in order to become an administrator you have to have this, I mean, I, I don't know. These are the types of things that the community is going to have to figure out for themselves. But we, our project is not intended to actually require anything. Uh, yes? Can I comment on responsive design and mobile first? Yes. Uh, we are doing mobile first design now. That's kind of the thing. 
uh, that's like p curation toolbar, the, the page triage stuff. It was actually, it's actually tablet focused and not, not mobile focused, simply because it's really difficult to use on a, on a phone with the, with the screen real estate. Um, we are, you know, we are doing things that are coming into like our, our, the Agora project or things like definitives about like icon sets. We're building an icon set and here's how they go and this is the behavior and so 40 pixels minimal is like pretty much the size that we want to have for buttons because that's a touch screen and so forth and so on. Now the mobile team, oh, do I, I, I want to make sure I'm not going to get shot if I say anything. Okay, I got one of them over there. Um, <clears throat> the mobile team is actually, their current skin is, or the beta skins that they're using um, are actually not Wikipedia skins. And so there's a whole conversation to have about that. So ideally, we would have one skin that could be, you know, that would just auto detect where it is. And Brian Vibber is not in here. He wrote it, he made it, oh yeah, yeah, it's right there. He, he did a demo of one that actually works for like an earlier version of Athena. And I, if you ask him nicely, he'll probably show it to you. Uh, but yeah, we've, we're thinking very heavily about it that way. Uh, huh, huh, huh. I get to check my watch again. Uh, Yaron. <laughs> Thank you. You should think of Athena as a kick to the head. <laughs> uh, it, it's just about, it's really that's the, that's what it is. It, it is it is intended. It it's not that any one of these things is what's going to happen, right? It is what needs to happen is that we need to break the paradigm that everybody has built in their brain about how Wikipedia works. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to go radical. We've got to go like outside of this and stop making the same mistakes, you know, in the interface. Steven. Well, okay, so, okay, the question is, is with global profile, is it possible to think, to make things, the, the profiles different on different wikis? Am I, am I hearing you right? Yeah. Okay. So, like, yeah, on commons, it might be more interesting to have a, uh, <clears throat> a, a slideshow of my images, but not so much on meta, because I don't have any images. That, something like that? Yeah. Um, we haven't really talked uh, deeply about that kind of interaction. Um, it's entirely possible that we could do that. One of the functions, in a way though, what you're asking also kind of defeats the purpose of the global profile, is to like not have to have you log into every wiki and then set up, make setting changes there. So um, we could, but I don't know what the value is. Sven, again. Is, is, the, is the profile going to be something where the only thing you could put on the page is if I have the, pro the global profile for commons, I can't put anything else, or, or can you have a setup where I have the global profile and then for this project I can have something else I'm going to put under it. And uh -huh. that way the global profile doesn't have to change from project to project, it can still put other things on the page. Well, you said we, we, we haven't gotten too deeply into the, um, into the actual mechanics of, of, the, of the interaction for that. I don't see why that couldn't happen. It seems like it might be a good idea. I might want to have like a special like wiki text area that's different on German and on English, if I spoke German, maybe, which I don't. But um, I, yeah, I can see use case for that. Uh, got how much time do we have? Oh, we're done. Or we're supposed to be done. Okay, so uh, I got one last thing, and we'll be wrapped up. Let's see, I have a real barn star tattoo. But I also have about a thousand temporary Barnstar tattoos. So if you want one, you come find me, I'll give you one.